Well, if you don't have a firm grip on the five gases of the gas analyzer and how the engine produces these, take some notes right now. We're going to do a quick crash course or review for some of you on gas analysis. Now, first off, out the tailpipe, if the catalytic converter doesn't do a complete job of eliminating unburned fuel, which you will have in any engine in the real world. There will always be some hydrocarbons. HC that are not consumed in the combustion process. The catalytic converter takes care of a lot of them by doing further oxidation on the way out the tailpipe. When you have incomplete combustion resulting in HC, hydrocarbons, you will always have the byproduct called CO or carbon monoxide. Now that's that invisible gas, that you odorless gas that you, you can't see or smell that will asphyxiate you in the shop if you don't have sufficient exhaust uh, flow out of your shop with a hose or a positive exhaust flow fan. So carbon monoxide is the really nasty stuff when we don't have uh, perfect world, 100% complete combustion accompanying some of these gases if the oxygen, if the burning I should say, the burning temperature of the combustion chamber is high enough, we will actually oxidize or combine with oxygen, nitrogen, creating NOx, oxides of nitrogen. Now that is a byproduct of high combustion temperatures and so that's why when it gets richer you make less knock, you hear less knock and you make less NOx, sometimes we call that NOx. So when one goes down, the other one goes down with it. What combats NOx? Some form of EGR typically, exhaust gas recirculation valves or internal EGR with delaying or retarding camshaft uh, timing for the exhaust camshaft. So that's NOx. You won't really make that in the bay unless you have the engine clamped down to a dyno and put a real load on it because that's when you hear knocking, pinging, and that's when you make NOx. And then some more harmless things that come out the tailpipe. And the better the catalytic converter does its job, the more of this you will see. Oxygen, which is 21% of the atmosphere anyway, O2, and then CO2, which is a byproduct of complete combustion. So it's the very same thing that we inhale oxygen and nitrogen, we exhale, people do, CO2. That is what can lead to excess global warming, but by itself is not necessarily a pollutant, but it's something a five gas analyzer can read. More on using the gas analyzer coming up in this video clip. Let's talk about the relationship of the gases. The gases is a direct link to how the engine is performing and the catalytic converter. These gases are typically looked at through FU ratio. FU ratio or stoichiometric. Stoichiometric is the ideal condition or purpose for its formula, which is around 14.7 to 1. Of course, the FU ratio is 2. Lambda at 1.0 is also the ideal ratio for fuel control. Lambda is one thing that we should be looking at in order to come up with the correct ratio for these gases. The composition of air. Air consists of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. When we put air into the combustion chamber, we're utilizing the oxygen. The nitrogen is there for displacement purposes, but we don't necessarily use that. Air density, altitude, temperature, and pressure have a great effect on the way the combustion engine burns the fuels. The biggest being the altitude having the greatest effect on overall combustion of the engine. At sea level, air pressure is 29.29 inches of mercury. As we increase in elevation, that decreases one inch of mercury for every thousand feet. Gasoline. Gasoline consists of six carbon atoms and eight to 18 hydrogen atoms. Depends on the makeup. There are additives such as sulfur and metallic additives to help with combustion. Whether you're burning regular gas, super unleaded, alcohol, gasohol, or E85, these affect air fuel ratio. Air fuel ratio is calculated with fuel trims in the combustion. If the vehicle is not made to burn high contents of alcohol, it can have an effect on overall efficiency of that engine. Air fuel ratio we look at through long-term fuel trim and short-term combined. If the fuel trim calculations are off, it's going to change the way that engine burns, ultimately putting out exhaust through the catalytic converter that's not an acceptable environment for it. Air fuel ratio is a calculation we have used for years. However, the true calculation that we can use is lambda. Lambda doesn't have any influence 
from gasolines, whether it's super unleaded, regular, propane, or CNG. Lambda calculations are not affected by the catalytic converter also. Hydrocarbons, or HC. One hydrogen atom, one carbon atom. Hydrogen is a fuel that we put in the combustion chamber. Combined with oxygen, creates the power that we have in an engine. The concern we have is not being able to burn all the hydrocarbons in the combustion chamber. There's a lot of things that influence it. Hydrocarbons is high on both sides of the scale. If it's excessively lean, the hydrocarbons will be high. Excessively rich, hydrocarbons will also be high. Not the greatest indicator to start out with to find out if the vehicle is in a rich or lean condition, which is where we would like to start. There are quenching areas inside the combustion chamber. These quenching areas prevent the spark from reaching these hydrocarbons and burning them. Around the spark plug, valves, intake and exhaust valves, the head gaskets, where the head mounts to the cylinder block, there are quenching areas that prevent the hydrocarbons from burning. These are located in many areas around the combustion chamber. Piston ring gaps, cylinder head gasket gaps, around the spark plug and the valves. Anything that's cooler around that prevent these hydrocarbons from being burned. And unfortunately, they exit the exhaust. Another concern is carbon. Carbon holds on to these hydrocarbons and doesn't allow them to burn in the combustion chamber. After combustion, we release those hydrocarbons through the exhaust out through the catalytic converter. And the catalytic converter is now has to have the ability to take care of those. Misfires, whether it's mechanical, fuel, or spark, increase on either side of the scale. Readings are 200 to 400 parts per million pre-catalyst and 35 to 50 parts per million post-catalyst are to be a concern with hydrocarbons. This chart shows hydrocarbon scales being their lowest at stoichiometric or 14.7 to 1 or 1.00 lambda. Either side of the scale, hydrocarbons increase. To the right side, you can see where it splits off into two. During lean misfires, hydrocarbons increase even faster. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, one carbon atom, two oxygen atoms. We exhale carbon dioxide. Most of the carbon dioxide in the combustion chamber is converted from CO and oxygen. Carbon dioxide exists in our atmosphere. Oceans absorb it and release it in about a 50-50 mix. Ground soil also absorbs it and release it in about a 50-50 mix. Carbon dioxide is a great indicator of good efficiency of the engine. What we're looking for with CO2 is to make sure we're above 12%, even up as high as 15% is acceptable in partial stream sampling. If we look at this chart, we can see that CO2 is highest at stoichiometric. If we were to look back at the hydrocarbon chart, it's a mirror image of the hydrocarbon chart. So if we see high CO2, we can say that it's burn efficient. However, low CO2 is very hard to determine whether we're rich or lean. Carbon monoxide, or CO. One carbon atom, one oxygen atom. When there's not enough oxygen to support complete combustion, we create CO in a combustion chamber. CO is a byproduct of combustion. Let's say we put a molecule of gasoline under a microscope, and it's the size of this basketball. The outer skin of that basketball is CO, partially burned fuel. The air inside this basketball is HC, unburned fuel. The key is to make these molecules as small as we can so we can burn off the vapors outside the hydrocarbons. So under that same microscope, let's say we took this soccer ball. Now, what we've done is we've burned off more of it. The outer skin of the soccer ball is CO. The air inside the soccer ball is HC. However, what if we can even make it better than that? Advanced fuel systems like direct injection systems have made this better. Now we can take that same microscope instead of the basketball and the soccer ball, and we may have something the size of a ping pong ball. The outside of the ping pong ball is CO. Inside that ping pong ball is HC. Now we burn much more, and the engine will be much more efficient and less pollutants going out the tailpipe. These are the things we've done in the past to make the engine much more efficient and have the catalytic converter work a little less than it has in the past. Acceptable levels of CO, 2% pre-catalyst, and 0.3% post-catalyst. Those should be our maximum limits. This chart shows carbon monoxide. Its lowest level is at stoichiometric of 14.7 to 1. If we look to the rich side, you can see it increase when there's not enough oxygen to support combustion. 
When we see high CO, we can say that the mixture is bias rich. However, low CO does not indicate a lean mixture. Oxygen, two oxygen molecules. Most oxygen is used up during combustion. The leftover oxygen is brought down to the catalytic converter and used for oxidation of HC and CO. Acceptable levels, pre or post catalyst, zero to two percent oxygen levels. This chart shows oxygen levels low at 14.7 to one or stoichiometric. To the lean side, it increases. To the rich side, it levels out. Low levels of oxygen does not indicate a rich condition. However, high oxygen levels do indicate a lean condition or possibly an exhaust leak. One nitrogen molecule, an unknown number of oxygen molecules. When the conditions lean, about 16 to one is when NOx increases very high. This 2500 degrees is focused around the spark plug area in the combustion chamber. We need to control these and lower these NOx levels down as low as we can. Some of the fuel control systems we have today are increasing up as high as 25 to one. The reason we can do that is after 16 to one, NOx falls off that scale just as fast as it went up. We've known about NOx for a long time. The federal government mandated EGR valves put on all vehicles in 1973, so we must have knew about it many years before that time. Today, some vehicles don't even have EGR valves. We do it with different things like valve overlap. We do, still do have EGR valves. And the catalytic converters are more capable today of lowering NOx or reducing it than ever before. When we're testing for NOx, the vehicle needs to be under a load to create high temperatures. This can be done on a dynamometer or on road testing. Either way, we need that vehicle to be put under stress or a load to create high, those high temperatures. When NOx levels are high, we can use the other four gases and combine them and codes to come up with the reasons why we have high combustion temperatures along with the other four gases in the combustion chamber. This chart shows all the five gases together and the NOx being the darker one. We can see that NOx levels are the highest at about 16 to one. This is the reason we wanna keep the combustion chamber temperatures down as low as possible. When these temperatures rise, NOx is increased. Next, we're gonna talk about excessive emission levels. High HC levels can be from excessively rich or lean conditions as we mentioned earlier. Good way to look at this, short and long-term fuel trim or what's called total fuel trim, adding the short and long-term together. This is an important step to find out how that vehicle is reacting to the fuel that's been put into that vehicle or a condition that might be faulty with something in the system. A leaking fuel injector can cause high HC. Ignition malfunction or a misfire can also cause high HC. Incorrect ignition timing can cause that. Could be a, due to a timing chain problem or even a VVT problem, variable valve timing. Variable valve timing plays an important role in the power that we produce from these engines today and that has to be correct in order to keep emissions down below their acceptable levels. Low compression can also be a fault of high HC. Worn or burnt valves, guides, and lifters can also cause high HC conditions. Defective cylinders, pistons, and rings also cause that. It's really a tough sell when you go to your customer and tell them you need to replace the spark plugs because if you were to show it to them, they're not worn out. We have platinum plugs and iridium plugs that may never wear out like we're used to seeing the older style conventional plugs. These plugs do wear out though, however, from contamination that build up on the porcelain inside the plugs and cause them to short out. These should be replaced periodically. Manufacturers suggest 100,000 miles to replace these plugs. However, you and I both know that to remove them plugs after 100,000 miles may be fairly difficult. We have an open ground and secondary ignition can also cause high HCs. Remember, HCs can be high whether it's rich or whether it's lean, it doesn't really matter. PCM or ECM not adjusting properly. There may be something influencing that ECM or PCM causing conditions that may make the HC conditions go high on that vehicle or hydrocarbons. High CO levels or carbon monoxide. Rich fuel mixture, air fuel mixture can cause high CO levels. Leaky fuel injectors can cause high CO levels. Clogged air filter, defective AIR system, variable valve timing, over advanced ignition timing, a plug PCV system can also cause high CO levels. High HC and CO levels together. This could be a plug PCV system, defective air system, or excessive fuel in engine oil. However, not as popular as it used to be with fuel in the oil, it still does happen occasionally. Low oxygen and high CO levels can be caused by a rich fuel mixture. Leaky fuel injectors, clogged air filter, excessive fuel in engine oil, 
or a defective O2 sensor. High oxygen and low CO levels can be caused by a lean air fuel mixture. Vacuum leaks or air leaks. Defective fuel injector, defective O2 sensor, or the PCM-ECM malfunction. Low CO2 levels can be caused by leaking exhaust system or a leak in your sample hose, a rich air fuel mixture, or a clogged air filter. Testing using a gas analyzer is probably one of the most efficient ways of determining if there's a fault in a system. Typically, when we have a catalytic converter code, a lot of technicians choose just to replace the catalytic converter. Unfortunately, that's maybe not always a fix for the vehicle. The catalytic converter's performance may be low and set a code due to other system problems. We have to determine what the other system problems are first. The best way to do this is with gas analysis and take an analyzer and determine what's coming out the tailpipe to figure out if the underlying problem is something from the engine control system. An imbalance in fuel mixture can make a big difference on how that catalytic converter performs. If the fuel mixture isn't correct, the catalytic converter may not even be possible to light off. And if it doesn't light off, it's incapable of oxidizing HC and CO and reducing NOx. That'll deem it useless on the vehicle. So we have to determine what the cause is first before we replace that catalytic converter. Replacing a catalytic converter, in a lot of cases, after a fault like that, can keep that light off for weeks, months even after that time. Unfortunately, after a period of time, the catalytic converter may be damaged from the underlying problem or the engine control problem that we have originally in the system that was misdiagnosed. So it's very important to make sure we diagnose this system properly. There are ways to do this without a lot of work on the vehicle with gas testing. The following calculations we're going to use an ANSAID Lambda calculator. This Lambda calculator will lead us down a path to look for the known problems that it may be when diagnosing a vehicle. We are going to be using Lambda, and Lambda is like a European calculation of air-fuel ratio. We haven't used it a whole lot in this country. However, it has a lot of benefits as compared to air-fuel ratio. The benefits are far more exceed air-fuel ratio than it ever has. If you're in a location where you do especially ASM testing or dynamometer testing, it's very important to use four or five gas testing and Lambda calculations to repair the vehicle. Lambda is a calculation which pays particular attention to oxygen and carbon. This calculation is so much more important than what we use for air-fuel ratio in the past. Air-fuel ratio used to be a great indicator of rich or lean. It's no longer the case, and this is the reason why. Air-fuel ratios today, in some of the vehicles that we have out there, are somewhere between 9.8 to 1, as high as 25 to 1. With these calculations being so different, not within that 14.4 to 14.8 that we used to use with narrow band sensors. It's very important that we use a different calculation to identify a fault in the system. The PCM has set strategies that it uses for E85 fuels or different alcohol contents in fuel. The concern we have is if a vehicle is not made for that and able to adjust for those conditions, it's very hard to determine if that vehicle is burning properly due to the fact that it's not made to burn any more than 0% alcohol. So these calculations, even with 10% alcohol, the fuel trims can be skewed a bit and it's very hard to determine if it has an effect on the catalytic converter. So it's very important for us to look at this in a different manner and that is using Lambda. Lambda is a measurement that determines richness or leanness without being affected by the catalytic converter. So we can actually put it in the tailpipe and get direct readings of what that engine control system is doing. Variations in the fuel, whether we're using regular, super unleaded, or E85, have a great influence on how that catalytic converter is going to perform and engine control systems. So it's important we use a five gas analyzer to determine what's coming out that tailpipe of that vehicle. Lambda is presented where a number as 1.000 is the preferred stoichiometric fuel control, or 14.7 to 1 as we used to know it. A Lena mixture is going to be greater than that 1.000 lambda. So if we see anything above that, we consider that lean. Anything below that 1.000 is considered to be a rich condition, a little bit reversed to what we're used to looking at for oxygen sensor calculations. An accurate reading at the tailpipe is very important to get. Make sure it's not diluted from an exhaust leak. A diluted exhaust leak can throw our calculations off with lambda considerably and give us false indications of a problem with the system. So exhaust leaks are very, very important to catch before we start calculating lambda in the system. An incorrect diagnosis can lead us to a false repair on a vehicle in a lot of cases. So for an example, if I had an exhaust leak in a vehicle and the exhaust leak was about 10% leakage, 
the reading that would be taken from the gas analyzer would be plus 0.1 lambda, or approximately 10%. The effect would be an incorrect diagnosis. Imagine a correct reading of lambda a 0.9.00 with an overrich condition. With a 10% leakage factor, this might show up as a 1.000 lambda identifying it as no problem at all, as a good fuel mixture. This is why exhaust leaks are so important to identify. The same would hold true if lambda was 1.00 and we had a 10% leakage factor of a reading of 1.1% lambda. The calculation would be excessively lean on that system. The ANSED software that we're going to be using will identify faults in the system to lead us down a path to make a correct diagnosis on these systems. This is a screenshot of the ANSED calculator which will be used to identify faults in a system. What we do is we put in the gas readings that we have and the lambda calculator will come up with a direct termination of what may be wrong with the car. Before identifying that a cat is faulty, we need to make sure the lambda calculations are within a certain range. A lambda calculation that it was out of its range may prevent the catalytic converter from lighting off completely. This is the reason why lambda calculations can be so useful in this field. So first verify that we have lambda. A reading between 0.995 and 1.005 lambda after a repair. This step is critical to make sure we have consistent readings outside that range. The catalytic converter may not be able to light off and be efficient. Before we begin any testing, we want to verify that Lambda is within fuel control in this vehicle. We want to make sure the engine operating conditions are proper before we begin any testing on a catalytic converter. In order to do that, we're going to put our gas analyzer on the vehicle, and we're going to start the vehicle up and see what our Lambda calculations are. We can see this vehicle now, after running for a short period of time and has warmed up, that Lambda is within its limits. Lambda is within .1000, or very close to that, during these conditions. This vehicle is in very good fuel control. Performing a cranking test, what we want to do is we want to prepare the car and precondition the cat. So we want to run the vehicle at a minimum of one minute at 2,000 to 2,500 RPMs to preheat the catalytic converter. From that point, we want to shut the vehicle down. We want to disable the ignition system as quickly as possible keeping this to a minimum of one to two minutes. After we disable the ignition system, we want to crank the vehicle over for 10 to 15 seconds while watching the CO2 levels on our five gas analyzer. When the CO2 levels climb about 12.5 to 13.5 percent, this gives us an indication that we're able to take HC and CO and oxidize them in that converter, turning it into CO2. We can see our levels reach 12.2, 13.6, and 13.7. We're up over the 13 range with this catalytic converter. But we can see this catalytic converter is capable of oxidizing HC and CO into CO2. Go do a snap throttle test. The snap throttle test is going to consist of bringing the catalytic converter up to temperature by preconditioning it. That means running the vehicle at over 2,000 RPMs for at least one minute. At that point, we're going to quickly snap the throttle to wide open throttle and then take your foot off the accelerator. During that time, after your foot's off the accelerator, we're going to watch CO2 emissions climb. The CO2 emissions are going to be climbed from the amount of fuel being delivered into the catalytic converter. At that point, all the oxygen is going to be used up trying to convert CO into CO2. We need to watch these levels to make sure the catalytic converter is capable of converting those CO levels into that CO2. Okay, now we can see our CO and HC are down very low. Now if we give it a snap throttle, now we can watch our CO levels climb. There is a slight delay with these gases. We'll actually see the CO levels rise like we do right now and our oxygen levels are going to be low. Right now we're going to be looking to make sure that we have enough oxygen to convert CO into CO2. And now we can see this catalytic converter being very efficient is now dropping that CO level down very low at this point. One thing to keep in mind, a lot of these vehicles today are so complex with VVT tumble valves, electronic throttles, very hard to do some of these tests like wide open throttle conditions or hold the idle at 2,000 RPMs. 
do the best you can. Sometimes you may have to push the gas on and off during some of these tests to load the converter up when we're testing them. Because you want to feed it as much fuel as you can in order to get the accurate test results you need out of these catalytic converters.